the Sims make some magic. And Harry Potter gets aggressive in Quidditch World Cup. I hate flying lizards. It's game time. Setting a poor example for America's youth, it's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Well, at least we're setting an example. No. Welcome to X Play. Today we have Lord of the Rings, Aragorn, Legolas, cute hobbits. And we have a Harry Potter game. Slytherin, Hogwarts, and Quidditch. And a game about fighting Nazis in World War II. Not a fantasy game. Historically accurate. But wouldn't World War II be better with hobbits and dragons? Perhaps. No. Yes, we also have the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And the Sims Expansion Pack, Dwendal Expansion Packs. It's magic. Oh, this is a nice jazz hands. Thank you. But we're going to get it all started with EA's Return of the King, Hack and Slash. Yes, and if you love the movie like I love the movie, you will want to play this set. See, it has Gandalf and Samwise. Right, and it's all in the review. Let them watch it. Oh, but it has Gimli also, and it has a photo. It has... For a wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he needs to. Make no mistake, to play Return of the King is to experience the epic chaos of the film trilogy firsthand. Hurry, Gandalf! I am coming, Aragorn! Similar to last year's Two Towers game, this is a straightforward hack and slash. Choosing from a large assortment of characters, you will defend Minas Tirith as Gandalf. Everything collapses! Tread the pass of the dead as Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. It's all coming down! and brave the journey to the cracks of doom as Sam and Frodo. Rest assured, it will be no easy task. Well, against our stronghold, the Dark Lord summons both man and beast to oppose us. An army of powerful forces, more terrible than we can imagine. Almost every stage in the game features huge set-piece battles against dozens of foes. You're graded on your ability to dispatch the spawn of Mordor efficiently and with combo moves, which in turn affects how much experience you earn. Between stages, you can level up and purchase new moves and combos. Return of the King adds the ability to spend extra experience to buy stuff for all the characters at once. This helps get your crew up to snuff quicker, but also maxes everyone out fairly quickly. This makes replaying the game with other characters a bit too easy. Of course, you might just want to replay the game to see the brilliant recreations of the various film locations. Some of the environments are so detailed, you can almost smell the pipe weed. Did I mention they're huge? I did, okay. I'll mention it again. The stages are huge. The shortest mission in Return of the King is as long as some of the longest stages in the two towers. The one thing that hasn't changed is that your allies aren't the sharpest pikes in the armory. They're almost no help at all in the Pelennor Fields battle. Lady, I won't leave you. They must be saved. Hey, Mary, try not standing still underneath the most dangerous enemy on the battlefield. The Witch King circles above. Not that it really matters when you're slicing through hordes of Uruk High like a one-man army. <laughs> Still, it's kind of weird the way Legolas and Gimli just kind of stand around while you're trying to save the freaking world. The game is pretty short. Quick, we have to get through this as fast as we can. You can blaze through all the missions in about the same amount of time it takes to watch the actual movie. Still, bonus features and secret characters lend some replay value. There's also the co-op mode, which allows two players to hack their way to glory. This is our final act to give Frodo time, time to end this evil that marshals before us. Return of the King manages to push past its flaws to deliver an epic and satisfying experience. Any fan of the films will love it. A four out of five. of shadow. 
Yes, excellent. This game makes me want to see the movie so badly, but here's a warning. If you play the game before you see Return of the King, it will spoil the movie for you. Yeah, so we're reading the book. You don't have to get a spoiler warning for something that's been available for 50 years. I'm just saying. Also, in the game you can unlock, unlock three bonus characters and you can play as... Ah, oh, right, I won't spoil it for you, but some of them might be hobbits. Okay, oh, okay, and at the end you play a level called, and this is the actual title of the level, The Crack of Doom. I don't know if I want to play in Doom's Crack. <laughs> but if you, if you haven't had your fill of cinematic fantasy in video game form, I have more for you, I do. Here's a review of Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup. Is the World Cup played in Doom's Crack? It's not a good place. That's right, Quidditch. Say what you will of the Harry Potter juggernaut, if there's one thing J.K. Rowling did right, it's coming up with Quidditch. This isn't some pansy ass fairy tale sport, it's bone crushingly brutal. If you haven't yet been inducted into the cult of Harry Potter, here's the deal. Two teams of seven square off on an oval Quidditch pitch. Three chasers try to gain possession of the Quaffle and toss it through one of the three rings for ten points. Meanwhile, the two beaters try to whack the bludges onto the other team. At the same time, the Seeker is keeping an eye out for the Golden Snitch. Catching the Snitch ends the game, awards your team 150 points, and renders the events of the rest of the match largely pointless. At the start, you can play as any of the four Hogwarts houses. The problem here is that the matches are way too easy. While playing through the house matches, we only got scored on once. I was a Hufflepuff. Stupid. Once you've slogged through and won the House Cup, you can move on to the World Cup. The bad news. Harry Potter is relegated to the sidelines. Ties things up. The good news, the game actually gets challenging here. Yeah. Playing Quidditch turns out to be surprisingly straightforward. The developer took a game with absurd rules and somehow managed to make it play well in a video game form. Yeah! Usually, you're guiding your chasers around either with the quaffle or in an attempt to tackle the one who's in possession. Yeah! After a length of time determined by your skill on the pitch, the golden snitch will appear, triggering the final play of the game, the snitch chase. The problem here is with the combo and special move controls. There are a lot of moves, but it's unclear if there's any advantage to using one move over another. Worse yet, it's hard to know how to do the exact move you want. This leaves the game feeling a bit shallow. But that doesn't mean this game sucks. Far from it. This is a very nice sports title that captures the essence of Quidditch. Harry Potter fans should snap this game up, and some skeptical gamers will find something to like here as well. X-Play gives Quidditch World Cup a 3 out of 5. Yeah, I'm going to pass on catching yeah. the quaffle and the whacking the bludger. Bludger? I barely knew her! No, oh, Adam. Don't worry, Ace. We got you covered. Coming up, we revisit the turtle power movement of the early 90s. Once again, the only two people with a GameCube cozy, Adam Zessler and Morgan Webb. Uh-huh. GameCube cozy? Oh, you know, it's like a beer cozy or a tea cozy, but, you know, for GameCube. Welcome back to X-Play. Yes, now do you remember the early 90s? You know, Nirvana, My So-Called Life, and Flannel? Snossages. That was the 80s. Well, what well, Morgan's point is that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were big in the 90s, too. Now they had an arcade game that was sort of like the Simpsons and X-Men four-player arcade games. And it was pretty fun then, and then they made it for all the consoles, except now you can only play it as two players at once. Aww. Yeah, I know. And I would like to point out that on both the Xbox and the GameCube, there are four controller ports. We are not amused. Here's a review of TMNT. Now it is.
yes, memory lane. You all remember the turtles, don't you? So happy together. No, not the 60s band, the mutated teenage ones from the 80s. Don't worry, April. We got you covered. Yes. It seems like America ran out of original ideas years ago. So it's no surprise that these little rascals have popped up once again, this time on your PS2. Shell shocker! Shell shock! Unfortunately, this reincarnation is about as inspiring as an old episode of Blossom. Now, how come no one has come up with that game idea? Whoa! Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is the perfect example of a licensed game that focuses too much on visuals and marketing power and not enough on actual gameplay. Even by side-scrolling basher standards, the gameplay here is weak and uninspired. The lack of complexity in the fighting system combined with the lack of variation in the action itself leads to a game that, despite being gorgeous, is still a total snooze. This game takes the new cartoon series and uses it as a jumping point to string together its series of thug-filled levels. Yeah! Now, despite all the bad things that we have said thus far, the graphics are, without a doubt, stunning. The cartoony images are bold, bright, and colorful. And Turtles is definitely one of the best uses of this recently overused graphic technique we've seen. The voice acting and sound effects ain't bad either. Help me, please! Overall, the presentation is the greatest part of the game. It's a shame that the rest of the design can't follow suit. The levels move through various parts of the city, and while they look terrific, these stomping grounds suffer from an incredible lack of things to interact with. Hey, dude, you're making me look bad. Keeping in line with the lack of interaction in the levels is the lack of interaction in the turtles. Are those guys ninjas? The gameplay is comprised entirely of repetitive bashing, with virtually no strategy, no depth, and no technique at all. Worse, however, it's just really boring. To add to the shell shock grievances, the game only supports two players. Considering the arcade game from 1989 supports four players, this is inexcusable. Sorry! X-Play gives Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles a two out of five. Today, we turn our focus to The Sims, those little people we've been micromanaging since the year 2000. And we've covered their expansion packs, their nonsensical language, and we taught you how to kill them in horrible, horrible ways. And now, the final Sims expansion pack has come out, and this one lets you do everything you could possibly want. Now, this is the last chance you have to mess with your Sims in a 2D world, because when The Sims 2 comes out next year, everything will be in 3D and made of glorious Polygon. So until then, why not go crazy in the final expansion pack? Here's our review of Sims Making Magic. Yes. Sims like this franchise has been around for a while. Dating Sims, skins for Sims, and Sims Live and Large have been whining, sleeping, and dancing their way into our collective consciousness for years now. Oh. Oh. Making magic pretty much lets the Sims do whatever the hell they want. Oh, it's not yeah. but Not with ease, mind you. But with a magic wand, there's a lot you can accomplish. This time around, you'll visit a variety of ethereal locales, where the locals are busy kibitzing about them, thar shades, spirits, and potions. <laughs> You're just an average sim starting out, trying to make your magic bones. Wait, <laughs> um, yeah, let's not start Adam Sim here in Dolesville. Yeah, baby, that's what we're talking about. You'll have to feed him, change him, and get him with somebody regularly, or he'll start whining like a kid on the Neverland Ranch roller coaster. <laughs> hey, looky here! There's a hole in the ground. These are the portals to Makin' Magic's all-new mystical realms. Once in residence, you'll witness strange behavior, partake in odd potables, and witness wacky magic acts. Ample amounts of dread will be added to your potion when your sim starts griping about sleep, food, and booty he don't got. <laughs> Mixing potions and casting spells all entail gathering ingredients from other world oddballs. Some potions require a bit of your own cultivation skills as you churn butter and gather honey, apparently delicacies to the citizens of the gloaming. Let's try this. Beeswax, beeswax, fairy dust. Oh, okay, looks like a lava lamp. <laughs> Crap! A plague of snakes! Potions simply require trial and error. Great, she's in love with him after all that work with the other one. 
That's the great thing about this game. Things that took forever can now be achieved quickly through magic. Yeah, but it takes friggin' forever to get the goods or good enough to be magic. Unless you've got this handy cheat. Back to the salt mine, Adam Sim. Get your rearing gear. The sheer amount of task-based gathering needed for magic to be fun and some age-old camera scrolling issues bothered us a bit. But for the sheer amount of new items and the imaginative inclusion of illusion, we pull from our magic hat a four out of five. Aha! Uh -huh. And let's not forget all the Easter eggs in making magic. Yes, one of the coolest Easter eggs in the game is at one point you can get some magic memes. Now you plant your magic memes and boom, up comes the star. Climb up the star. And up there is a giant sleeping Will Wright. <laughs> that is the creator of The Sims. Well, I think he's tired from all the expansion packs he's been making. Mm. Now, it kind of reminds me of the X-Play Easter egg. What's up? That's when uh, you go into Adam's Cube midday and he's sleeping under his desk with a pile of fudge. Fudge? Up next, don't lose your lunch, it's Secret Weapons over Normandy. Once again, two people from a land before time, Southern California, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. It's really old out there. <laughs> Welcome back to X-Play. We have a new flying game from LucasArts, but it is not a Star Wars title. Instead, it takes place during World War II, and it's up to you to rid the skies of the German menace. Here's a review of Secret Weapons over Normandy. Wait, which weapons? Shh. Secret weapons. Aren't they airplanes? No, they're dungarees. Yes, they're airplanes. Way to spoil it, Webb. September 1st, 1939. Germany invaded Poland. This was the start of the Nazi... Yeah, yeah, we know all about World War II. We play games for crying out loud. In Secret Weapons over Normandy, you play an American volunteer in the British Air Force. Your mission, to foil the Nazis using the most advanced aircraft available. As the new guy, you'll have to earn the respect of your cohorts, but you'll quickly become close with your comrades in arms. Damn if I'm not good at judging your talent. You're showing promise. I've got a proposition for you. Maybe just a bit too close. Where other recent games like Crimson Skies focus on experimental and sometimes fantastical planes, Secret Weapons over Normandy is firmly based in reality. The secret comes from your classified missions. You fly a variety of planes in dogfights, bombing raids, and our favorite, escort missions. Every once in a while, you'll take a break from the aerial action to man attack guns. With Hitler's invasion of England now indefinitely postponed. Cutscenes are brought to you a la the History Channel. Nothing like slowly zooming in on still pictures to give you an authentic sense of documentary tension. I wonder if that would work for us. The year is 2003. The console wars are dominated by the PS2. The Xbox and GameCube fight for market share against the Sony behemoth. Two plucky co-hosts wage an unceasing battle against the forces of video game Mediocrity. Mm, maybe not. Secret Weapons is definitely not a flight simulator. It's easy to jump in the cockpit and start mowing down Jerry. You can switch between a third-person view for dogfights and a top-down view for bombing the crap out of your enemies. The only problem with this interface is that with your plane locked in place, it often feels like the sky is moving around you rather than you flying through the sky. During dogfights, it's easy to lose track of where you are. Oh, oops, it's upside down again. Also, while the bombing raids are chock full of variety, the dogfighting missions that make up the bulk of the action all seem about the same. If you shot down one fast-moving spec, you've shot them all. Ultimately, Secret Weapons over Normandy gives a strong performance on many levels, but finds itself stuck in the hangar when it comes to the actual feel of flying. We give it a war-torn three out of five. We're withdrawing immediately. I suggest you do the same.
You know, something we didn't mention in the review is the game's nifty unlockable bonus. This is cool. And by finishing the game, you can actually play with an X-Wing or a TIE Fighter. Yes, you can fight Nazi airplanes with Star Wars Starfighters. Uh -huh. So now your evil empire, TIE Fighter, can destroy the evil Nazi warplanes, which actually begged the question that's plagued me for, for okay, years what? in eons. What did the Empire do that was so evil? I mean, they were just trying to, like, get get the galaxy back on its feet and everything, right? They, they blew up Alderaan. That's right. Mm -hmm. I guess That's Alderaan evil. is kind of like the new Poland. I guess it is. Hey, if you want to talk about Alderaan or World War II or Poland or anything else, visit our website. That's techtv.com slash xplay. Now, while you're there, there's other fun stuff to do. You can look at some fun videos of, yeah. of Morgan fighting Jedis or me getting hit in the unmentionables or something like that. Yeah, that Plus, we got naked cheat funny. codes from Max Payne, too, that you kids seem to love. Yeah, people I don't like know that why. one. Yeah, I wonder why. I don't know. What's, what's, what's naked like? Good night.